So hi everyone, I'm Svea Klosser. Um, I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I have uh, here with me Surendra Shikawit. Um, hi Surendra, I can see you. Um, hi. So he's a, <laughs> we've been working together, um, he's at the University of Rajasthan in the anthropology program there, and we've been working together on this um, ASHA research for about, um, two years now. So it's great to have all of you with us. And um, really, we're really looking forward to the discussion more than anything. Uh, we're writing up these results now and it'd be really interesting to get feedback and thoughts from you guys. So, yeah. So yeah, we can start with the first slide or the next slide, I guess. Thanks. Um, so this quote is from Dr. Tedros, who's the Director General of the World Health Organization. He's been in the news a lot lately. Um, but this quote was from a couple of years ago. And community health workers have held an important position in international health discourse and practice, at least since Alma-Ata in the 70s, um, as part of community participation in health. And India's had several iterations of community health worker programs in different parts of the country. Um, but India's experience mirrors the world a little bit in that community health workers were not hugely um, emphasized at the national level for a while. And then they've sort of come back globally and in India as a really important part of um, national health strategies. So in India, you have, of course, the ASHA program um, and also the Anganwadi program, which we'll talk about as well a little bit. Um, because those programs are actually quite intertwined in Rajasthan. But there's been a resurgence, resurgence in discussion about community health workers, in large part as part of new narratives about task shifting. Um, and of course, um, in the COVID era, um, there's a lot of discussion about community health workers as well. Um, we don't have anything about COVID in this talk. All of our work happened um, before COVID began, but we'd be happy to think about it and talk about it with you guys as part of the Q&A. So next slide. So this slide is from Carrie Scott, who's a researcher actually um, who's based in Bangalore for years. Um, some of you may know her. <laughs> um, but this looks at some of the debates around community health workers that have been around since the 70s. Um, and you can see that on one side, there's sort of a leftist idea of what a community health worker should be. They should be a liberator. They should be an activist. They should be of and for the community. They should be empowered. Um, and on the other side, you have sort of a critical view of what sometimes they actually are, perhaps. That maybe they're self-interested. They may be an employee. They may work for the health system. They may be exploited. Um, and so these debates or these tensions are things that have been in community health worker programs in India and elsewhere since the 70s. Next slide. So this is a cartoon from 1977 and I apologize that the, um, it's a little hard to read, but this illustrates that these debates are really of long standing. So this is a cartoon by David Werner who's you may know from the Where There Is No Doctor series of books. Um, and here I'll read it for you just because it's a little hard to read. You've got a, an international um, NGO or development agency worker pulling up in their land cruiser saying, you will now decide for yourselves by majority vote in 17 minutes, which of you is to become an obedient and unquestioning puppet of the health system. And this is supposed to be, you know, community decision-making international style is the the caption here. Um, so these debates are really heated and often polarized about what is it that community health workers are, what are they supposed to be, but at the same time ethnographic or survey work exploring the actual lives and experiences of CHWs has been pretty rare. There's been a sort of explosion of work on this area in the past few years, but prior to that there was very little work actually asking community health workers themselves how they felt about this stuff. Um, so what we're trying to do um, is to inform these discussions and these debates um, with an understanding of how CHWs themselves feel about these issues and also understanding their lives in social context. Next slide. So there's a, 
an estimated 5 million community health workers serving their communities across the world. Um, so that estimates from Henry Perry, who's a colleague of mine, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a million ASHAs and another million Anganwadi workers. So 5 million is probably an underestimate globally when you think about um, the numbers just in India alone. And those are only the workers employed by the national programs. There's other community health workers, of course, employed by NGOs, other agencies, stuff like that. But the estimate is that there are approximately twice as many female community health workers as there are male globally. And certainly in India, there are many, many, many more women than men. There, you know, all of the national programs are all female. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, women are ideally positioned for maternal and child health work in many societies, including, of course, India, where they have better access to homes and better access to um, expectant mothers. Um, there are also a lot of discourses where they're seen as more caring. So a recent uh, One Million Community Health Workers report claimed that women, this is a blanket statement, women are less likely to consume alcohol in the evenings. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's a lot of sort of ideology or romanticization, perhaps, of women as more, um, more caring and more selfless than men. Another reason that women are often chosen is that the work is seen as empowering. So the discourse here is that women are, um, that employing women as a community health worker actually empowers them within the household. Um, this is an interesting claim and one we'll explore in this talk. And then finally, and significantly, this is not often discussed openly, but when you talk to policymakers, the fact is, that men are often unwilling to work for the amount of money that CHWs are paid. Um, and you can get women to work for a lot less. And this is something we'll talk about in a moment as well. Next slide. So, oh, sorry, I didn't, <laughs> you can just advance to the, the next few uh, bullet points. I'm sorry, I had these up here. That's great, thanks. So, Many of these female workers are volunteers. So this word volunteers is a little tricky. So ashas and Anganwadi workers are also referred to as voluntary workers. Um, but as many of you may realize, most of these people are not actually volunteers, either globally or in India. Um, they're just talked about as if they were. So there's a number of reasons that volunteer labor is often used for community health work. And these are very different reasons, but they overlap in various programs and various different stakeholders may have these motivations that sort of overlap in creating a volunteer program. The first one is necessity. There's huge numbers of community health workers, again, 900,000 ASHAs in India. And when you think about the prospect of putting that many people on the government payroll, it becomes very difficult. Um, to think about the budgetary implications of that. So um, ministries of health generally don't like to take donor money for salaries. Um, donor money is often time limited. They can only promise something for like two years. Ministries of health don't want to create salaried positions that don't have long-term funding. And so it, it becomes very difficult for ministries of health to, to think about how to fund salaried positions for that many people. The second reason is ideology. Um, at Alma-Ata in the 70s, there was this idea that community participation in health was really important. And this conception of the CHW or the community health worker as awakening political participation and community engagement in health at the local level has been really important. And it was really important also in the creation of the ASHA program I spoke with some activists who were involved very early on in the creation of the ASHA program. And, you know, they felt quite strongly that the ASHA should be a volunteer because if she was a government employee, then she would become accountable to the health system and not accountable to the community. So there's a, there's a feeling that if a CHW was going to be an activist, if she's going to be community accountable, then she can't also be an employee of the health system because then she's going to be um, ingrained in the health system, not in the community. So some people think that community health workers should be volunteers to keep them community accountable. And finally, there's this practicality issue that it, as one uh, policymaker in Geneva told me, 
quote, it seems to be enough to get them to work. If you um, pay a very small amount and call them volunteers and sort of why spend more when you, than you have to when there's lots of pressing needs um, facing um, limited health budgets. Next slide. So to get to India's ASHA program specifically, again, there's 900,000 of them, and she's supposed to be a little bit of everything. Um, she's supposed to be of and for the health system. She's supposed to deliver services and also be a social agent doing community activism. Um, so in the official documents, she's supposed to be a link worker, um, building bridges between um, populations and health systems. She's supposed to be a service extender, actually delivering some first contact health care. And she's also supposed to be a social change agent, um, catalyzing social change in her community. So these, this sort of complex list of tasks is a result of compromises between the leftist activists that advocated for the program and then also the demands of the national government and then international donors like the Gates Foundation. So for example, the Gates Foundation pushed very hard to have her um, remunerated um, with incentive-based payments um, for specific tasks because they felt that that would help um, make those tasks happen and then also reach, at that point, the MDGs, which the government also liked. And that was a really different set of um, ideas about what a community health worker should be than the left leftist activist ideas that came out of um, some groups in India. So an ASHA gets money um, for each vaccination she encourages and each mother who gives birth at the health post. Um, she, so she gets incentive-based payments for very specific tasks, mostly around maternal child health. In Rajasthan, she also gets a small salary from ICDS, the um, ministry, the Women and Child uh, Development Ministry that employs Anganwadi workers. Um, so in Rajasthan, the ASHA actually goes to the Anganwadi Center, works with the Anganwadi worker, and um, so she is employed both by ICDS and by the Ministry of Health. In either case, her money doesn't add up to a lot. She gets between $50 and $100 a month um, for doing this. And um, because she is tied to the Anganwadi Center, she's expected to be there for three hours a day, plus her field work. And she does a lot of additional things for which she's not really paid. Um, but the pay structure often determines what she actually does. So um, most ASHAs focus on the things, understandably, for which they get um, incentives. So she doesn't get paid for activism. She doesn't get paid for community mobilization. And some of the activists who started the program have commented that realistically, perhaps the government doesn't really want 900,000 poor village women mobilizing for their rights. Like that's not really what um, maybe the government actually desires. So next slide. So I'm gonna let Surendra take it over for a moment here. Hello everyone. Our research was mainly focused in a town that is uh, almost one hour far from Jaipur. Uh, mostly we did uh, participate observation in household health centers and other activities like strike, attending their meetings. And also we uh, go with them door to door to how they work and other stuff. We also did 70 plus um, unstructural inter interviews with uh, like ASA, Satin, Anganwadi Karikarta, ANM, doctors, union leaders, and uh, these workers, family member to get to know all of you. We also did some uh, focus group discussion with uh, uh, so many people. Yeah, and in this picture, you can see like the social condition, uh, how in a village still like uh, the social things like women are sitting down say, uh, like on the ground and men are sitting on chairs and other. So next slide. So our, our first example, we're going to walk you through a couple different uh, women that we got to know quite well. 
um, as examples to think with um, for what community health work means for women. So this first example is a woman we'll call Anju. It's not her real name. Um, she has uh, three, children, three children, two girls and a boy. Her youngest is nine months old. And she's been working as an ASHA for seven years. Um, she was nominated for the job by her father-in-law, uh, selected by the Grand Panchayat, and got sent for training to a nearby village. So we talked to her father-in-law about why he'd sent her for this job. Um, like most ASHAs in Rajasthan, um, the decision to join the work wasn't really hers. It was a family decision. So her father-in-law said, you know, we thought this job will become permanent and the salary will become 5,000 or 10,000 a month. That's why we put her in this job. We have fields and animals. So now we're annoyed with the way this work is going. She's been doing it so long though. Do you just quit? There's still some hope it will become permanent. So that's what he said. And that really echoes a lot of father-in-laws we talked to who had put their daughters-in-law in this position, um, worked through political channels to get them in, hoping that this would become a permanent government job, that it would provide some stability for the family. But instead, it was a quite time-consuming position that actually provided very little income. So back to what this father-in-law was saying, he said, we've hired some laborers to come work in the fields. And we asked, well, how much does this cost? And he said, it costs a lot more than she makes. So it costs 250 rupees a day, plus two tea breaks. You have to pick them up and drop them off. So for the family, um, the costs of having their daughter-in-law working as an ASHA far exceeded the income that she brought in since they had to actually hire um, farm laborers to do the work she wasn't doing at home. So Anju told us, at first I really wanted to quit. It was so hard. My mother and father-in-law told me, stick with it. It could become permanent, but I was so ready to quit. It was so difficult. At that time, I didn't know anything. I had never worked outside the house. I'd never written up a report. It was so, so difficult. But my mother and father-in-law said, no, don't quit. In earlier days, I didn't know anybody. Gungat also worried me so much. But now I can talk to anybody. It's no problem at all. I know about everything, right? It was hard then, but it's no problem now. I do all my work easily and I get respect from everyone in town. And it's so, so satisfying, making sure no child misses their immunizations, that they all happen on time, and that women are taken care of when they are pregnant, and helping out with malnourished children, helping their under parents understand what to feed them. So this was also really common in the women we talked to. That at the beginning, the work was extremely difficult for them. They really wanted to quit. And this is particularly relevant um, in the Rajasthani context. These women were um, coming from other areas. When they come to their husband's village, there's very strict um, veiling guidelines. Um, many of them had never really been outside the house in their husband's village at all before they began working as an Asha. And so were completely unfamiliar with everybody um, and were very worried about what people would say about them. So we asked, um, the, Anju's mother and father-in-law about this. Her mother-in-law said, lots of people said things at the beginning. Her father-in-law said, some still do, but most people understand now. But they used to say, what's the point of that work? She's just roaming around for no reason. She's not doing her field work. Her mother-in-law said, people just say she wanders around. She's talking to everybody. But what to say if she gets a permanent job, it will be okay. And her father-in-law said, we explained to them what her work is, that she's preventing polio, that she's immunizing children, that she's helping people. And people understand now. In fact, Anju, who had never left the house before she started this job, has really wide mobility at this point. She used to walk to the health center, which is a few kilometers away, and then her um, mother and father-in-law actually got her a scooty so she can drive around the village on a scooty, which she goes everywhere now um, with that. Um, her entire salary goes toward the scooty payments. The patrol comes out of pocket. Those are more costs for her family um, to support her ASHA work. Um, but this is really significant. Um, and there's a number of ASHAs and Anganwadi workers that have scooties now in, in this village. And it was totally unheard of for women to, to have that prior to this. So this is a, a big change in their family and social relationships as a result of their work as an ASHA. Next slide. But they have a substantial work burden at home and at work. They're the primary workers for the household, these young married women. Um, other people, of course, work too, but the majority of the field work and the work at home falls on the young um, daughter-in-law. 
And these responsibilities don't change that significantly because they're employed outside of the house. So almost all of them we talked to got up at 4 a.m. Um, to care for animals, make tea, breakfast and lunch, clean the house, um, prepare the children for school, um, and all of this to get to the Onion Body Center by 9 a.m. Um, so then to be at work until sometimes um, early afternoon, um, returning home, wash the dishes, wash everyone's clothes, work in the fields, cook dinner in the evening, um, clean up, work with the kids in their homework, and hope to get into bed by 10 p.m. Next slide. Oh, uh, there we go. So, Surrender, over to you. Yeah. So, mostly families, uh, they put in this uh, position this woman because these jobs, they think they are respectable and close to home. And they hope one day they will be get permanent. And if they will get permanent, it will be near to them. Like they, they can easily go from your home and it will be always in the village. And, <clears throat> and also they think uh, these jobs are almost uh, close to teachers and these women like Asa is working with doctor that is really respectable and they think other kind of jobs that, that is available in the village, like uh, the machine workers, uh, sewing work and working in field and others are not as respectable like Asa's work. Uh, one of the Asa's family uh, member was telling us his sasur of her, like my daughter-in-law is so intelligent and she worked with doctor. She goes and work at hospital and like of course he is getting paid really low but still uh, it's good for her and so many uh, asas are like uh, uh, really the pay are low and the work is a lot you need to do a lot of going here and there so many meetings sometimes you need to go to, like other places and but still we think one day we will get permanent and and they feel this job is honorable so they just say like bas yahi hai ki izzat ki naukri leke baithe hain so they just think uh, that job is more uh, like respectable uh, for them next slide So our next example is a story of Mina, another, another Asha. Um, like Anju, Mina found the work very difficult at first. She didn't know anyone or anything, and her husband didn't want her to work. For 500 rupees to go to work, he'd asked, leaving the kids. And she said, it was so hard in the beginning. The first thing I had to do was a survey of 10 houses every day in this huge area. And at that time, whenever I left the house, my mother-in-law would scold me. People can see your teeth, people can see your chin, the neighbors are watching. Just think about it. In that position, I was heading out to do a door-to-door -door survey. But she says her father-in-law supported her and ultimately her mother-in-law did too. Against this, her husband couldn't really object. Now she travels widely and knows more about the health system and the world outside than male members of her family. In fact, when her brother got sick, it was she who went with him to another city and helped him navigate the health system. Ultimately, she was gone from home for weeks and he died. She wasn't able to save him. Her father, her brother, her mother, and her sister have all died. And so she said recently, and she said the work is a refuge. Here she's valuable and people need her. One morning we showed up at the health center hoping to meet her and she wasn't there. She arrived late, tired from having been awoken at 2.30 a.m. because someone needed her to come with them to deliver a baby. She offered to take us to visit them. Um, and this was one of those like completely heartwarming moments. The woman was just over the moon with her baby. The grandmother of the baby couldn't stop talking about how wonderful Mina was and how she'd helped them out. Um, and the grandmother couldn't stop talking about how she does for families what parents used to do. So later in the day, we went to a meeting of Asha's um, at the hospital um, and Mina attended. 
So 15 or 20 ashas sit on a large carpet spread out in the hallway. And um, basically what happened is that the ashas got um, yelled at for a while about how their lists of, um, and their paperwork didn't quite line up with the expected numbers. Um, so there's a problem with this, there was switching over to an electronic system, all the paperwork wasn't consistent, and this was an issue. So the Ashas weren't shy about talking back about what they had or hadn't done, and Mina was the most vocal of the Ashas there, speaking back to the high-level supervisor with seemingly no problem at all, explaining what the reasons were that the Ashas couldn't do what he thought they should be doing. Um, but as she was talking to him, she was, you know, sort of worrying her purse handle, nervously fingering the straps, and afterwards she was just simmering mad. She heard about a union for Asha's and was instrumental in getting women in her area to sign up for it. She regularly attends strikes and she agitates for a living wage or a permanent position for Asha's. This involves organizing travel hours away from her home. Next slide. Whoops, uh, we should new about, yeah, there we go. So Surendra. Hello. Yeah. So after getting this job, they really uh, can go out more, meet people more, can get more socialized, and they feel more independent. Like already, like Suya uh, told us, like how difficult was before for them, and how hard was uh, when they start this job. But now they are able to help their family, and not only family, they even helping them in their business. Sometimes they are able to do like their family business uh, purchasing. They are uh, uh, going out of uh, state for helping their family. Another one, and so they feel more uh, mobilized and more uh, independent. Even uh, one. Uh, uh, Asa, Asa's uh, husband said, like, uh, she is the first woman who uh, used the scooty in the village. And it was really surprising for, for all uh, the villagers here. And after see her, so many women are uh, like even uh, want to buy this uh, scooty and want to do uh, the stuff she is doing. And so they also said like before they are only uh, living in the uh, home and doing the stuff of uh, uh, like home but now they feel more comfortable more uh, like uh, open they uh, they can go outside because of this job they feel like sometimes they are like i like one asa says i am go go crazy at home so dimag kharab ho jata hai and they whenever they co come out and they can meet more people and more women so they are more like happy and feel more like sun next slide so at the same time that this program has given them um, new mobility and new opportunities Asha's also said that they were exploited workers and they're laboring at the bottom of a bureaucratic hierarchy with little opportunity to advocate for their own rights, much less those of their neighbors. And the biggest issue that we heard about again and again and again was the very small salary. Um, you know, women repeatedly compared their salary to a range of other positions. Um, often they refer to teachers who are, were permanent government employees with a government salary. Um, but in fact, work as an ASHA earned women significantly less than these same women could have made by engaging in unskilled labor. So this photo here is of the Mahanarega program in the village, and these Mahanarega workers are making significantly more um, than ASHAs are making. So in fact, though, ASHA work wasn't particularly out of line with other wages for educated jobs in the village. Um, for example, you could work as a private school teacher um, that also paid around five to 7,000 rupees a month. 
Um, one young woman who worked as a teacher in a private school commented, even if they raise our pay, they'll raise men's more. They'll keep us at one level and men at a higher level. So the very low wages for educated women in this village were a result of um, both gender inequality, but also the intense need for women to maintain honor. As Surrender mentioned before, they really wanted these honorable jobs, teacher, nurse, you know, um, government employee. Um, and these work opportunities for educated women are really in short supply. Um, 20 years ago, very, very few women in this village had an education. Now many of them do. In fact, most of the Ashas we interviewed had um, not only bachelors, but many had master's degrees. Um, and there's just too many educated women in the village and not enough jobs for them. And this really drove the wages for these very limited educated positions for women way down. Um, so any job that was honorable for women in the village um, for an educated woman paid much, much less, in fact, than manual labor. So as one woman commented, um, this job is service to society. The salary has no meaning because we get nothing. Uh, next slide. So our final example, um, or a third example, is a woman we'll call Anita. Um, and she's actually um, has been an Asha um, since very early on, um, before it was even a national program. She was um, part of a different community health worker program. She started in 1996. Um, she said her husband's uncle was an officer, um, and it was all in his hands. He encouraged people to put her in the job. Um, her father-in-law refused, but ultimately, um, Anita pushed for it, and with her un husband's uncle's support, um, she got into the position. Um, so she talked about how, just like the other women we've said at the beginning, um, it was very difficult at first. Um, for two years, in fact, when she first got the job, she wasn't actually allowed by her family to go do it. Um, she said, for two years after I got trained, I sat at home. Um, and then finally, the officers um, prevailed on her father-in-law to let her go to work. Um, and she says, now, these days I go everywhere. Ganga Nagar, Jaipur, Jaisalmer, Chitragarh, everywhere. Nobody can stop me. Nobody can scold me. If I don't want to go, they say, go. Why did you become a leader? Now that you're a leader, go. Now there's no problem. So the reason we want to talk about Anita is that she is a major union leader um, for Asha's across Rajasthan. She actually doesn't live in exactly the same village we've been discussing. She lives um, in a different one. Um, but we want to discuss her a little bit because her story tells us a little bit about how Ashas are trying to advocate for their rights um, and for salaries mostly, and what's happened to them. Um, so early on, um, she heard about a strike and she showed up in, um, in Jaipur and she said at that point, 50,000 Ashas showed up. Um, that may be an exaggeration, but the point is there were a lot of them. Um, and at that strike, a union leader heard her speaking and recruited her to become a union leader for him. Um, so he used her as an intermediary to collect union dues from women, um, to organize strikes, um, and to pull women together and motivate them. So she's been doing that for five or six years at this point. Um, next slide. So go ahead, Surendra. Yeah, as um, Shreya said, like uh, in starting was uh, it, for her it was so hard, but now she is a leader. She she is moving around and have all uh, the relation with the uh, leaders, and she is even have some posts from given by them. And so sometimes. Uh, they have like even problems like uh, the union leaders want more money. They are collecting from them and they even do not tell them accounting. So like the point uh, about talking about dues and other stuff is like, like they are now that much motivated. They can even ask to these union leader, like what is going on? Like you are uh, taking that much money and what you are doing and if you are helping us you should at least tell us the accounting and other stuff and 
so some uh, because of that thing they even fight with this union leader and and uh, they ask if you are not going to uh, give uh, these accounting then uh, we are no more in your union and uh, so it uh, the stuff like that happen some some asas are in these kind of unions and they get uh, kind of cheated by them they get uh, they give them money and they don't know what happened with the, their money and they keep asking for money so in that that point the all asas and with the help of the anita they are uh, going uh, they already build a new union by themselves and they they are do we want like last strike they did we, as we know they are all their own there was no union leader including or helping them so <clears throat> next slide so if we uh, talk about uh, the union leaders politics and other stuff so mostly these leaders are collect connected with some kind of sort of parties like some uh, connect with bjp some are connected with congress and other so mostly they have a control over on them so that stuff also uh, tell by us uh, tell uh, uh, like uh, anita told us like uh, they already have like some kind of control over them so sometime even like if Uh, let's suppose there is bjp government in the uh, in ruling so they will not do so much protest if uh, the union leader is uh, kind of connected with this bjp party so it was really hard for them and they even asked for uh, to them like why or why why they are not raising their voice in front of bjp even you are a kind of connected with them and Uh, you can do like more because the the you are with the same party but like she also mention like the same leader want to uh, fight or want to run for a election for a member of parliament and he was asking a ticket from them so i think there is like a connection between uh, a big political party this union and that really effect to these asas so even we get to know in the end like recently uh, one of the union leaders uh, wife get elected in parshad uh, uh, election and it was a particular party and we already know he was in uh, like influence or uh, uh, with this party so they all know and now they also like get frustrated like they know uh, like it is hard or it's really complicated for them so these uh, asas are more aware now and they are asking question to them now next slide so yeah as surendra said the unions have been have had mixed effects for the ashas um on one hand they're the only venue where they're able to get together mobilize most ashas do feel that they've been instrumental in helping their pay get raised at the same time the leaders are often using these unions just to show political parties that they have large followings and once they get power within those political parties they often have little interest in empowering ashas in fact um they may be more interested in keeping them quiet than anything so the unions aren't always working for the women themselves um so we followed several women who were trying to organize themselves anita is one of them as surendra mentioned another woman named seema is one we were been following who lives in jaipur most of the women who are very very active as union organizers um kind of have nothing to lose they tend to be um widows or divorced or somehow trying to support their families. Um Seema was quite militant in her organizing. She organized a number of strikes where people did things like lie down in front of the um Minister of Health's car. They got arrested. Um she spent several nights in jail. Um but in the end it didn't really lead anywhere. She didn't have the connections to turn that um activism into anything that 
led anywhere. And eventually when we talked to her about a year later, she'd basically given up. Next slide. So we went to one strike that Anita organized and it's sort of indicative of what happens when the women tried to strike without these political leaders. Um, they were pushed by city officials into a, uh, this side road, which you can't really tell, but it's completely invisible from anywhere. They ended up sitting out in the sun and rain all day and didn't ended up getting sort of herded away by the police at the end of the night, having accomplished almost nothing and um, really getting very little visibility despite a lot of effort on their parts. Next slide. So um, across CHW programs, um, empowering women to provide more health services, paying a living wage, and providing formal opportunities for job advancement are things that CHWs tend to really want, um, and the ASHA program is no exception. Um, next slide. Oops, sorry, I've got some strange bullet points appearing there. Um, so yep, anyway, uh, we really thank the Fulbright NARA program, so the governments of the US and India that funded this work, um, IHMR um, in Jaipur, which was our um, institutional home, and um, the Hopkins Department of International Health, which has also funded a bit of this. So we really look forward to the discussion um, and would love to hear your questions. Um, so one question I can start with, or I don't know, um, Shirley, if you want to frame this, this portion at all. Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I was just planning to go off of some of the questions that were already in the chat box, and then if um, after that, then we can open it up to the wider floor. People can either type or ask directly. I think the first question I see here is from Alok, where they're asking, what's the research question that this study seeks to find an answer? How is this qualitative mm -hmm. beneficial and transferable to different contexts? Oh yeah, great question. So I'm an anthropologist, so is Surendra. The research that we do um, is really different than a lot of what's done in public health in that what we're just trying to do is really, really understand the social context of what's going on in one particular place. So in terms of a research question, it's a little bit broad in that our research question isn't very specific in terms of cause and effect or something like you would see in an epidemiological study, but it's really looking at understanding the context and the social dynamics underneath the ASHA program. So that's it. I mean, we had sort of a broad mandate for ourselves and that we're just trying to understand what this work means for these women in social context. So why would you do that? Um, it helps you understand a lot of the outcomes you see. It helps you understand some of those cause and effect you might see in epidemiological studies. Um, I certainly would never claim that this is the only kind of research you should do, but I think it's very important to understand um, those sort of more quantitative findings in context. Um, so it's a, a different kind of perspective on what's going on. Um, is it transferable across India? Definitely not. Um, it's, a, it's a snapshot of what's happening in one village. It's a very deep snapshot of one place in actually one time. Um, but understanding the sort of anthropological perspective is that really getting a good, deep understanding of one place is the best way to think about what some of the deeper dynamics at play might be. And as you, you know, as you think about the context where you may work or other CHW programs or ASHA programs in different parts of India, um, some of this may resonate. So it may open up some ways of thinking about um, what might be going on for people. Of course, not to say that what's happening in Rajasthan is the same as what's happening in Bangalore, because it's certainly not. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Um, I'm looking for other questions, but I, I guess while people have them and they want to type them, um, I can start us with another question too, was, which is, um, do you guys have thoughts or have you been in touch with your informants to understand how COVID has shifted some of the things that you've studied um, and conversations that you've had so far? Yeah, I mean, Surendra, what if you've been speaking a little bit, not a lot as the short version, <laughs> so certainly not in the kinds of depth that we have from this other stuff. I mean, Surendra, you have been talking to some of them about their experiences with COVID. 
yeah they are like feeling so proud that they are doing work in in this pandemic and they are kind of helping in this uh, government system and uh, going around meeting people and telling them and aware them about this uh, corona disease and yeah they are doing great and uh, some some are like telling us oh uh, surendra bhaiya now we have two cases in my uh, area and now i'm more afraid but we need to do work we can't sit inside the home even we are not getting paid much but but, but we are doing our job yeah yeah i mean i i think we were hearing i think thanks surendra i think we're hearing some of the same themes we heard before like pride in the job concern about the level of pay which is compounded of course by concerns about safety going door to door great thanks guys um i'll open it up to other participants in case anyone has questions feel free to go off mic um and ask them directly I had a couple of questions. Uh, this is Akash here, if I could go. Yes, please. Uh, so thanks guys for the presentation, fairly deep work. Uh, I had a couple of points, uh, uh, and perhaps they're more speculative than in terms of how we could think about the later part of this year and onwards, given that you've done this research in the last couple of years. So one thing I was thinking about is that given as you know, the Indian state has had uh, a fair enough history in the last couple of decades where, you know, worker rights, unionization have been actually on the relatively downward curve, right? Uh, simultaneously with the rise of automation and other conversations in other parts uh, of the economy and elsewhere, for a lot of people, especially funding agencies, et cetera. The future of work is emerging as a certain kind of a conversation. And what I was, what struck me here is a particular kind of conversation on future of work. However, unfortunately, the existing future of work conversation is, you know, too narrow in terms of thinking about only technology and or what will AI do, et cetera. So I was wondering, given the, you know, the last couple of decades of history and uh, because you do mention that participation in uh, unions or unionizing has had mixed results. So how do we see this going forward in the wake of COVID? Because this is a workforce, however, not very organized, not very formalized, that has indeed done very critical work in terms of delivering healthcare. Uh, the pandemic impacted a lot of the services that this workforce provides. And now, you know, different state governments and others are trying to get them back on on a track. So I was just wondering what could be this kind of tension between these, seeing these kinds of workers getting unionized. Uh, yeah, that was, those were the two sort of interrelated points. Thanks. Uh, those are fantastic points. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know that I have a lot to add. I would love to hear what others think. I mean, those, that's a really great question and such good points. Um, I mean, I think it's a great point too about AI and technology. Um, you know, as we were doing our work, the ASHAs didn't yet have uh, phones, but they were being rolled out for Anganwadi workers. And what was very interesting for us is that the Anganwadi workers were already figuring out ways to sort of game the system and make, you know, how do, how do we get around these sort of monitoring tracking system that these phones represent? Um, so I think part of the answer to that question is that the the technology is going to get used by or you know the the ashas and the anganwadi workers are going to use the technology as much as the technology drives them um so it, it'll be an interesting relationship but i would love to hear other people's thoughts on this because those are some great comments about what what's a way forward you know and from my position in baltimore i don't have as much of an answer to that um, but i would love to to hear what people think
Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Feel free to jump in. I think, uh, hey, uh, this is Sarim from Mudahir. Uh, you know, government is trying to use the technology and the reach of technology is still their regular frontline workers like a &M. So all the services uh, government wants to implement, uh, they are using, they are entering all the data in the tabs. So government of India has launched a tab in which all the services are whatever work they have done, they have to enter it. And this is some sort of collecting the data as well as the monitoring process. But uh, Asha is still untouched with it, but definitely those, you know, uh, we always talk about 3A model, that is Asha, Anganwadi, a &M. So the primary function of this group is to work uh, simultaneously together uh, for the health of the village. So yeah, but they are getting equipped with these technology uh, slowly and hopefully at some point of time, uh, maybe a couple of years uh, later, I mean, uh, after that we'll, we'll, we'll see some kind of technology they are using at their level also. So hopefully it, has, it should be done. Yeah. Thanks. I saw a couple questions in the chat. One, um, whether they used technology much previously when they went door to door. The answer is no. Um, in fact, they had, uh, we counted at one Aganvadi Center, 19 different registers they had to fill out. So it was very, it still is very, very reliant on, on paper, even as the technology systems were getting rolled out. Um, there's a heavy reliance on paper. And in fact, that was a huge amount of the work that the Asha's did. Um, was paperwork. I would say that that time spent doing paperwork far outweighed time spent providing services. Um, sometimes that was a great thing. In many cases, they were able to um, get uh, local women connected with the entitlements that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to, to navigate the paperwork for. So for example, a lot of what the Ashas were doing was um, helping um, local rural women get bank accounts, get Vamasha cards, get them set up so that they could receive the incentives that they were supposed to receive for, say, uh, vaccinating their female children. Um, yeah, great, great point about potion. Um, and a, another great question about community-focused care in COVID-19 response. I mean, I think absolutely community health workers could be completely critical in this for all the reasons that that community health workers are <laughs> are critical across health programs. Um, they the ashas know every single family in the village. They know where everyone is. They have a sense of how tied those people are into the health system. Um, they're regularly doing community surveys that they could find out about COVID. Um, and then you know, of course, again, all the same issues arise around pay and and motivation. Yeah, and also like uh, government give them some task in between, like people they are coming from outside of state or uh, like um, uh, outer place, they should be quarantined and they are the kind of in charge or looking forward or see like everything is okay, like he's quarantined or not, and like following all the rules or not and awaring nearby uh, like neighbors that you should be aware like he can be corona positive or something so they are they are uh, like totally uh, doing a lot of work and uh, in this corona period yeah great point that like contact tracing and isolation is something that asha workers are really ideally positioned to carry out yeah because uh, uh like a doctor can't uh, know every single person and they know all the single person, even like someone can come and they even don't know, but they know every single one. So it's really uh, good. And even in the screening process also, they, they know who live in this home or not. So like, like so government make to do them like sometimes so much uh, like in big area, they are doing screening and they are in that team and they are they can be really helpful to tell them how, how many people of course we have like papers and like 
how many people live, live in it but still see you no know, physically who live and not live here thanks um i think we're at time so i'll i'll just ask one more question um to you both and really it's for, for everyone here i think you've highlighted you guys have highlighted a lot of challenges and also opportunities with how the frontline health worker system in india is built up and just curious to know like do you have recommendations of how it can be designed better like how can we center um you know kind of what these women want and need in their roles um building off of all the things that you've highlighted in this talk and other research as well. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. I mean, I think when you talk to the community health workers, to the ashes themselves, they're very, very clear about what they want. They want job security, they want a salary, and they want the opportunity for more advancement and training. So like they want the ability to perhaps become an AM or a nurse at some point in their career. I mean, really sort of basic stuff that all of us would want when you think about it. You, as you have your career, you want the opportunity to be paid for it, to support your family with it, and to advance in it. And that's really what these women want as well. Um, and those conversations are often sort of cut off by these ideals that, oh, they're volunteers, they're village women, they should be doing it for their neighbors. But in fact, it's that kind of support that um, they're, that they're universally pretty much asking for. And that could be really powerful in, um, in helping them be a little more supported as they do some of this important work. And also uh, with the current uh, workload on ASHA, definitely there should be some point of, uh, or some kind of study which specifically focus to assess the impact of this COVID-19 situation on the mental health and issue uh, of on ASHAs. Maybe we can use some different skill in that and IES skill too. To, because, because they are actually working uh, very closely with, uh, with those, maybe uh, on the, those patients and those communities. So definitely this is something we need to be explored more. Yeah, that's a, a really excellent point. Um, it's something I'm thinking about going forward. I'm currently doing a study on mental health in um, health workers here in Baltimore. Um, but anyone who's interested in thinking about these things, please do reach out to me because I'm, I'm contemplating how to think about that, those very issues more broadly. So important. Thank you for bringing that up. Awesome. Um, uh, I had one question. Can I ask? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in one of the recent paper by Stuti Khemani and others uh, uh, from World Bank, they, uh, they, they have studied uh, uh, community health workers, particularly ASHA workers in Bihar, and their solution was that uh, uh, instead of an incentive-based in, incentive payment, a steady wage, wage structure, and also a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of a professional mentoring uh, of these ASHA workers would be beneficial in strength, strengthening this community health worker system. Uh, what are your observations on this? And and also, uh, did you see uh, some of these local leaders like uh, Sarpanch and other uh, uh, other ward members uh, playing any um, uh, crucial and active role in uh, promoting awareness around uh, public health in few areas? Because uh, there there are certain pockets, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, l like uh, uh, some tribal district where the issue of malnutrition is very severe and in fact uh, com uh, right now the community based uh, uh, management of malnutrition is uh, still overseen by ASA workers. So uh, how does this interplay between ASA workers and uh, uh, a local politician around some severe public health issues uh, happen there and also related to the steady wage structure and the professional network. Wow, great questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I haven't seen this paper. I'm going to look it up right now because it sounds like I should definitely read it. Um, those make a lot of sense to me. I mean, that's what the women were asking for was um, a steady wage, but more than a steady wage, um, things like job security, the ability to have maternity leave, um, you know, retirement accounts, things like that, that that sort of most workers would have. So yes, they were, it wasn't that they disliked the incentive-based pay so much as it just was too low and didn't provide them with any sort of security. 
Um, peer to peer learning would be fantastic. Um, I think that that's something they'd be very interested in. So I think that those those recommendations align with what we saw. Um, in terms of the Sarpunch's involvement, interestingly enough, many of the Ashos and Anganwadi workers um, commented that, in fact, the Sarpunch was also asking them to do a lot of tasks. So they felt like they had three bosses, ICDS, the Ministry of Health, and the Sarpunch, because they were already familiar with all the houses, doing door-to-door -door surveys. Um, they said that a lot of times the Sarpunch would also ask them to do, or the Grand Panchayat would also ask them to do door-to-door um, -door work sometimes related to health, sometimes not. Um, we did speak to the Sarpanch and some other people on the Grand Panchayat, and um, you know, they seemed generally very supportive of what the, the Ashas and Anganwadi workers were doing. Um, they talked about the, the challenges and sort of managing community expectations around um, getting women into those positions because they were so desirable because, the, again, those honorable work for women was, was hard to come by. So they, they had to do a lot of sort of community management in, um, in managing expectations around who was going to be put in those positions, especially since the ministries also had quite strict guidelines around that. Um, it doesn't really answer your question about malnutrition. Other than that, um, you know, I think that the, the Sarpanch, at least, you know, in this particular case, again, this is one village, it doesn't stand for all of India, um, was quite aware of what the, the Asha and Anganwadi workers were doing. Um, and in supporting them, but also asking them to do other things for, for the Grand Panchayat. So that was a, I think the ASHA workers felt okay about doing that, but felt like it was one more thing for which they were not getting paid. Yeah, and uh, like, I think Sarpanch is only like sometime helping them. Like, uh, let's suppose the measles thing uh, happening and so many uh, families do not want, uh, uh, to get these uh, uh, measles and other stuff uh, like rubella kassel, uh, and other stuff and at that time it is really hard for asa to make them convince to get this and at that time they asked sarpanch and ward punch to help them to make them aware about it so at that time i think a little bit uh, involvement of uh, like ward punch and uh, like local leaders they have Great. Um, uh, Sarah and Sandra, there's one more question if you guys are okay about entertaining in the chat. Um, you're asking, uh, I want to ask a question about Pradhan, appointing family members, special workers, uh, competent or not. Does that lead to more mistrust sort of situation or more trust amongst the community just because they're Pradhan's relatives? Yeah, so this, this question of political appointments of the Ashas is a fascinating one. We spend a lot of time talking to people about it. Um, it was more complicated than just uh, relatives getting appointed. So certainly relatives of people in the Grand Panchayat had an advantage in some ways. Um, certainly it was very difficult to get an Asha post if you had no political connections. Um, most people did have some. However, political connections alone were not enough. Um, you had to also have the educational qualifications. I mean, the ICDS and Ministries of Health have a very, have sort of a, an algorithm almost for selecting ASHAs. Um, so that, those two things kind of had to line up. Like just having political connections wasn't enough to get an ASHA post. You also had to have the, the educational qualifications. You also had to be at the top of the list um, on the ICDS Ministry of Health rubrics. Um, and then, you know, some families talked about, you know, once we got our daughter-in-law into this position, there's actually a lot of social pressure to have her perform well. Otherwise people will say, oh, she only got the job because it was a political appointment. Um, so, you know, in some ways, <laughs> the social pressure could, could push her to, to actually work. Um, you know, one father-in-law said, we've got to make sure she goes, she's got to show up, she's got to do it. Otherwise, everybody's going to say, oh, you know, they just got her in there because they were politically connected. So, you know, that social pressure kind of works both ways. Um, so that's not a complete answer to your question. Um, but, um, you know, does it, does it lead to more mistrust or more trust? I think it's a complicated situation. 
um, where you had to have both political connections and educational qualifications to become a worker. And just having those connections didn't mean that you could, you know, kind of not do the work. There was still a lot of supervision and community pressure to show up. Great, thanks for that fantastic response and fantastic presentation, um, Saya and Sandra. Really appreciated. Um, I think with that, we'll close. Um...